All right, fresh out of the All-Star break with a brand new episode of the Cedric Maxwell Podcast. I am Josue Pavone, alongside Cedric Maxwell, who's already on the road. And we got a lot to catch up on, Max. I mean, between All-Star weekend, between the Celtics continuing the streak, it seems like they picked up right where they left off, right? I mean, I know they lost technically that last game before the All-Star break, but uh, the way this team has been playing defensively has, uh, has, has created – has created a wavelength to go to the NBA. I feel like they're on the they're on the national landscape now. You saw TNT talking about these guys using the word contender, which I haven't heard uh, in the same sentence of the Celtics all season long. But Mac, let's just start right there. I mean, uh, how are you, how are you feeling about this team? I mean, one one Celtics fan could tell you, ah, uh, well, you know, that was a shorthand in that team that the Celtics stomped all over by twenty plus point, another twenty plus point victory, and uh, they've won ten out of the last eleven. Now, throughout those 10 wins, Max, they've averaged over 20 points per. Now, regardless of what opponent they're playing against, this team is certainly on fire on the defensive end, and it's uh, collecting a whole stack of wins for the Celtics team, right? And I think that's that's true. I think I look at this team right now overall defensively. They're playing extremely well, uh, and they've come together. And I think that here again, the patience of us lay people, we're not good. Because we were to trade everybody. Now that they're winning basketball games, everybody's like, well, leave it alone. You don't want to bother anything. Uh, a few adjustments they've made by adding White to the mix. And I think he's a good pickup for you. Um, the game against Brooklyn, obviously Brooklyn didn't have their top players, but the Celtics went in there, really demolished them, and uh, never really let them get in that basketball game. And that was impressive to me, even to the point where you didn't even have to use, and I forgot about Daniel Tice was sitting over there. You yeah. didn't even have to yeah. use him uh, in last night's game. So yeah, this team uh, is hitting on so many cylinders, defensively, offensively. And I don't think I've seen Marcus Smart play better basketball than he has over the last couple of weeks. And he's been really good. But in these last yeah. couple of weeks, these last month, Marcus <clears throat> Smart has taken it to another level defensively and offensively setting the table for so many guys out on the floor. See, that's why I think it's so impressive, Mac, because, you know, you've seen it before. You've been around this league for so many years that you've seen when teams get hot, right? And what I mean by that is offensively. You know, the shots are falling. You know, they're getting good looks. I mean, sometimes that's more a fool's gold than a team that's really locking down defensively. Now, it's one thing to do it for a week a couple of weeks but man these guys have had the all-star break sandwiched in between they're continuing that same momentum that we saw from the end of the year into 2022 and you had head coach steve nash Nets head coach steve nash calling this team the best defense in the nba of 2022 now of course he did use that part at the end that people can say well yeah they've been the best team the past couple of months here the first two months of the calendar year but what's most important throughout the course of the regular season right max the later half or the first couple of months that we saw a completely different team well, I think the latter half is showing you building towards the playoffs. Think of it. You only have, you only have 22 more games to go. And uh, this is a sprint right now. Uh, you beat Brooklyn, so you probably put them in a the position where they can't catch you. You have a tiebreaker on them. Huge game coming back to Boston later on when we'll see if Brooklyn's going to have all their players. Kyrie obviously would be available on the road. And Durant looked like he's coming back. And will Simmons play? And so they're going to be a very dangerous team, but the Celtics have done exactly what they wanted to do. They've been very dominant. And I think you look at Jalen Brown, you look at Tatum. I mean, these guys have gotten together and put their heads together and, and put their big boy shoes on, big boy draws on, and said, look, we're going to make this thing work. Uh, we talked about Rob Williams saying that, you know, the Celtics are looking for the third player, the third star. Maybe that's it. Maybe Rob Williams is that guy. Uh, Grant Williams has played well. Let's let's make sure we we add him into the mix. And so you add White into the mix. These guys are playing real really well. And Pritchard has come off and played some pretty good basketball. So I think they're hitting on all cylinders. I'm glad you brought up the the, the Derek White trade because man, we haven't we haven't spoken in it quite a bit. So we haven't even had our official reaction to it. But I mean, when you looked at it on paper, I I don't blame the Celtics fans that were saying, "Well, wait a minute, two future first? For Derek White, because the Celtics fans, a lot of these Celtics fans, they're delusional in thinking that there's this quote unquote third superstar on the way, right? Oh, he's coming, guys. He's coming. Just, you know, line up the, the chips and you can, you can, you know, cash them in. And that just hasn't happened, Max. I mean, like, that's not what 
we, we Southern fans have been spoiled, right? I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like they, they, they're, they're envisioning this third superstar, but maybe what this team really needed to do is just double down on what on the pieces they have and trying to help those guys. And I think that's what they did with someone like Jerry White. He's going to move the ball for you. He's going to give you defense on the other end. And you sort of consolidated this roster in a space where you have not only a Derek White that you can throw in the mix, but you have insurance up front and someone like Daniel Tice, who, of course, knows the system, knows what Emay's trying to do, and is really familiar with those guys in the locker room. Yeah, that that is true. I think if you look at this team and, and the way they're playing right now and you add White into the mix – he is he's fit in perfectly shooting the basketball running the floor defensively really smart how he plays the game uh and the guy who's probably been as impressive in this run this year to me has been grant williams grant williams you know was for a while he couldn't hit threes now he's become a, a consistent three-point threat i know how smart he is on the defensive end i know he's gonna give you a great effort there so those and like as my broadcast partner Sean Grady said, the ancillary pieces right now are starting to step mm-hmm. up and make big divid pay big dividends. And if that can happen throughout the rest of the year, this could be this could be something special for this team. Which I think wouldn't have happened, Max, if if, if someone like Brad Stevens is afraid to trade future first picks. Now let me ask you this, man. Let's be honest. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait still, minute. Brad if Danny Ainge is still Brad, in that seat. Brad Stevens said this. This is what I love. Brad Stevens talked about Marcus Smart when Marcus made the comment about, you know, passing the ball and sharing the ball. And it was said that Brad Stevens said, I wish he hadn't said it out loud. Well, no, it needed to be said out loud. So <laughs> yeah, it, it puts did. more it onus, puts more pressure on the guys out there to kind of get in gear and, and put their chips into the table. And Brown and, and Tatum have done a great job. One thing they've, they, they've done really well, just the way I think is this. The fact that they address the elephant in the room. Everybody yep. said, well, they cannot play right together. On. And, you know, yep. you need to move them on. You know, I was even a guy right now. So how do you play Brown and Tatum together? Well, right now they've shut up everybody. They're passing the ball brilliantly. They're defending the basketball really well. And I think Tatum is growing up maybe even more than we've seen because he will let Brown essentially kind of run the offense for the first quarter. And not necessarily panic about, well, I haven't gotten a shot in five minutes or six minutes. And that means he's growing as a player. The great ones do that. He has to understand that he's a volume shooter. So he's going to get his share of shots. So you don't need to panic in the first five minutes when, well, what did did Tatum do? Did he get any shots? And he's done a, a great job of understanding that. And I think it's really worked out well for these guys. I just always thought that Marcus was going to be a scapegoat, regardless of how this team did. You know what I mean? Like, we we knew this team was going to – they were going to just come out the gate swinging. And we knew that Marcus would be the first name mentioned as, oh, well, that's what happens when you give the keys to Marcus. You need a real point guard. You need a real point Like, we never gave the guy a chance. I mean, the first 10, 15 games of the season, people hated it. They hated him at point. Now they're singing a different tune, you know? Well, I think in, in some ways they are, in some ways they aren't. Um, I was in Charlotte during All-Star – a uh, weekend, and I happened to be uh, Greg Gill on the plane coming back to Boston. And it was only one flight with uh, Jet Blue coming back to Boston. And the guy knew who I was. He was talking. He said, "Man, I am really happy with the trades and the way they made movements, but I wish they had done one thing." And I jumped him. I said, "Marcus Smart." He said, "Absolutely." Because you get rid of Marcus. I'm like, "Why?" I mean, what, 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 why are you getting rid of Marcus to, to for Just get rid of him. That's what they say. And, they and say, I mean, who is you know, going to, who's going to better set the table for this ta- team on both ends of the floor? Uh, you know, defensively, Yeah, we all know there's no question about Marcus' ability. What people have complained about is him taking bad shots or taking shots that he had to take because he was wide open. Right. I think now he's a lot more confident. And he gets the ball more with the shot clock with higher numbers to work with. He doesn't right. catch it with three seconds. He got a boom, boom, and got to jack it up. So I think that's really helped his field goal percentage out because he's getting the ball earlier, making decisions. Rob Williams has benefited beautifully from Marcus having that basketball, which is throwing those lobs. Uh, he's become a great facilitator and a great team player. He just had to adapt. Uh, I mean – 
he was the fill-in point, it felt like, throughout, throughout the course of last season when Kemba Walker was missing all those games. But this is the first time where he was the appointed starting point guard, and he needed to adjust. I mean, we we, we knew it was going to take a bit. I, I didn't know it was going to take that long, right? I mean, this team, by by Christmas, they, they, they were still, you know, struggling to try to find themselves. But I, I just feel like we needed to let him finish, right? It was like a month or two, not even, like like six weeks into the season. It's like, man, let, let him finish. You know, let him, you know when the speech doesn't start off so great and everyone's sort of looking at each other and everyone's sort of like sipping their way, wait, let the man finish, you know? Well, and just we wait, just wait, let's are. look at it this way. What was the low point so far this year? And I think we'll all agree it probably was the New Minnesota York. game. No, I, I think Minnesota even games, Minnesota yeah. was worse than that. Yeah, you, you, lost, you had a lead against the Knicks and, and lost that. Yeah, I understand that. That can happen. But the way they played Minnesota, Minnesota was a dead man walking team at that time. None of this, their starting five were playing in that game. The seven weren't playing. These were guys who essentially were, were pickup guys. And yeah. that team really just can't out hustle the Celtics beat them in every single way. They just and from, wanted them more. Yeah, and, yeah. and from then on, th this has been a different-looking team when I talk about their effort on the defensive, defensive end. That is when they're going to win and they're going to lose their share, share of games. They're rotating properly. They're ro rotating great now. I mean, you don't see as many open shots because the rotations have been so good and so tight. I just think what Brad Stevens did at the trade deadline is going to be something that we look back on and say, like, man, that was an underrated move at the time, you know? Uh, not just the, again, not just the trade of, of, of Derek White, but just reshaping the roster to a space mm -hmm. where, where everyone sort of knows, okay, this is the group, this is the core. Sure, you have some other ancillary pieces that are right at the end of the bench, but everyone in that core, everyone in that rotation has been there since day one. And I think there's a lot of relevance in that because it sort of gives everyone a sense of belonging, right? And then the all-star break happens and then you regroup and I love the way Eme put it. It was sort of like another another, you know, camp, like a pre-camp. Like, hey, listen, guys, this is like another training camp. We're gonna keep doing what we were doing, you know, before the all-star break. But I want y'all to, you know, dumb dumb down on that. You know, let, let's take it up another notch. And and I thought that's what we saw against the against the Brooklyn Nets. Again, it's a shorthanded team, but the philosophy and the and the approach, it's all mm -hmm. there. And, and and again, that sort of approach on the defensive end of the floor. In my opinion, translates way it resonates better for a team that's that's surging the way the Celtics are than it would if it were happening on the offensive end. You know, if, if it was just a, a you could you could chalk it up as to oh man yeah mm -hmm. they're they're just wide open or oh man their opponent wasn't defending them. No, these guys are playing defense regardless of who's on the other side. Yeah, and there's yeah. a lot to say about that. You know, there's a lot to say about that. Well, that that is the true measure of a team. A team, they're nice when you can't throw it in the ocean, and we've seen the Celtics do that. But consistency right. on the defensive end, that's the biggest thing because the consistency on the defensive end is all about effort. And you should never, a team should never give more effort than you. So I, I, I'm, um, I, I'm marveling right now as I'm watching this team connect so well defensively. Al Horford blocking shots, Rob Williams blocking shots. Grant Williams defending the ball really well. And you see Tatum and Brown start defend, defending yeah. their position. And when yeah. they defend their position, when your two best players defend their position, everything else kind of goes downhill and everybody else picks up the tempo and the pace. I just feel like there isn't a weak spot in the starting five. Like, I love the energy that these guys put out. And then at the same time. How about the starting seven? I love. Well, I was going to say the starting five I love, but then I love how – if the team is still, you know, if it's a close game, you're going to get that white line up to close, to close up, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's going to be the norm, but it seems like Emei is going to be leaning towards that lineup to close out. And I love that because everyone on that, you know, from one through five, you have the effort there. You have the defense. And then also they can score on the other end, you know? And, and, and Rob's confidence is through the roof right now. Rob's confidence is through the roof. The only thing I have not seen from him is developing more of a skill set around the rim with making little moves around the basket. What they're using yeah. him for right now is lobs and dunks. And um, it's really worked out well for him. But I think they're going, there's going to be a little bit sometimes when he gets the ball from about 10 feet away, if he could back his man in, get a little jump hook, spin move or something like that to add to his arsenal. Uh, Sat Sanders said that to me. He coached me and he's a Hall of Famer now, uh, but he was, uh, my coach for a while and he said, Max, Max, 
I've always wanted you when you were playing, I wanted you to go out there, develop an 18, 19 further because you have a great stroke. And I was my smart ass going, Sash, why? They can't guard me from five feet away. Why am I going out to 18 feet away? But I want Rob Williams to be a little bit more consistent <laughs> in what he's able to do offensively because we'll see him at the free throw line now. And he doesn't even look at the basket. Yeah. I mean, he he is looking to to list right. He's looking left, right or left, and he's just trying to give that basketball up. So I would love to see him do a little bit more of that. But uh, so far, as you said, what are the weaknesses right now for this team? No clue. I mean, the second unit, I mean, I, honestly, you, this can go for most teams, but one injury could really do this team in because that core, I mean, this is it. This is the eight-man rotation. And like you mentioned, you know, Daniel Tice sort of being that guy throwing the foul toe to jump in there. But, the, you know, for the most part, this is it. You know, Peyton Pritchard sort of mm-hmm. rounding out those mm-hmm. that rotation. And I don't hate it. You know, I don't hate it, Max. Again, I, I think it bodes well with this team's philosophy. Watch the way they're playing and the confidence that they're building in every game. And it doesn't matter who they're playing. Okay, we right. said, okay, that Philadelphia game, that's going to be a big test for the Celtics. Going into Philly against Joel Embiid, obviously didn't, they didn't have one of their main players, but Joel Embiid and his crew, and you have those guys down by 50 in their building, and right. then you come back against Brooklyn, obviously not having their core, but you got them down by 25, 26, maybe 30. The Celtics have been in the last couple of weeks have been beating teams up outside of the game of playing Detroit, the last game before the All Star, which could have been a trap game. The fact you did not have Marcus, the leader of your defense, and you didn't have no the leader of your defense, Rob Williams. Yeah. I think those two guys would have changed the tenor of what the Celtics did in those last couple of uh, moments of a game, and probably would have won it for them. I know, Max, you didn't see the TNT broadcast, but, man, Stan Van Gundy loves himself some Boston Celtics, man. This dude's gushing the entire game, how great the defense is. I'm like, man, does this dude watch every game? Because he was talking about things that only, like, you and I would really, you know, <laughs> hone in on. But um, he used the word contender, Max. And I was a little bit beside myself because I, I haven't heard any national head, you know, <laughs> <laughs> talking about the Celtics and using the word contender next to it. Is this something seem like contender? Yeah, like this is when this is when you this is when you grab your cup and you do like this. Slow your roll, boss. Slow your damn roll. <laughs> <laughs> Championships. Am I right? And, you Am know, I right? Okay. Championships. Right. I mean, really, this is what we're talking about now. When last week we're talking, well, a month ago we we're talking about trade this person and trade that person, but uh, I'm like, true damn, to man, his nature, true to his nature, you got money on the Stevens has, has put together a pretty good system, and these guys are on a pretty good road. And like I said, now I I don't even like to jump forward, but you got a Detroit team, which is you should be able to go in and win that game here. Uh, you got Indiana who is struggling, and then you got Atlanta who you just you know you just beat. You know, they're coming back here, but that big game is coming in when you have Brooklyn on a Sunday. So you got some huge games, and if Celtics can stay on the road, I mean, you're not that far away from first place, you know. Yeah. Where they're at That's now. the you, thing about the East. You, yeah. you can see first place from where the Celtics are now. Yeah, you know, I should have led with that. I forgot to tell the people, man. Max is in the hotel room in Detroit right now, uh, you know, staying away from the snowstorm, but there ain't a whole lot to do out there in Detroit, I guess. Right, Max? I was like, bruh, what's the know, plan for tonight? You was like, nothing, man. Nothing. Bruh, when you called me, you were talking about, let's do a podcast today. I was like, what else am I going to do? Last night, we got here about uh, 2 o'clock in the morning. I know some of you go, whoa, is, whoa is Max on your, your private plane coming in here? But we, we normally land. Your poor thing. You, yeah, give you, you guys a thing. taste of it is uh, normally we land on uh, these, uh, maybe sometimes in the inner city, in the city or city airports. But this time we're out in Birmingham, uh, Michigan. And um, it's outside. And there's another private runway that we, we go to, which is about, 20 miles away from Detroit International Airport. Well, we land last night at 2 in the morning, uh, and, man, we're in an ice storm. And when you come off the plane, well, there's no jet bridge. What you have is you have steps. You have about 25 steps. And they were iced up last night. And, man, I'm coming down like uh, uh, like Grandpa Jones, man, just slowly easing coming down with street shoes on, my hands on the rail, man. Now, how many people did you thinking, hold up? 
How oh. many people did you hold up? <laughs> All I could see was my feet just going, whoo, and me just shooting up in the air and, you know, coming down them steps, boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom, boom. I was like, oh, God, please. And, and yeah. I held on. So that was, but that's the transition that this team goes through, you know, being in, in these places with the weather. And I'm sure, you know, people don't feel sad for us at all, but uh, I'm just giving you a, a snippet. We got in at two in the morning. And by the time we got here to the hotel, it was about 3.30 in the morning, get your bags. So uh, it was almost time to order breakfast by the time everything settled. Yeah, Max, you just reminded me, man. You remember that one time I saw you fall? <laughs> the what? <laughs> now, one time, the only time I've ever seen you fall. You don't remember? Oh, was I, what, was I in the press room? Yes, yes, yo. So Max was walking, minding his business. This is like halftime, you know, getting our snacks and everything. And I swear, I knew, I think this would happen one day, but I didn't think it was, this is going to be that time. They, they always had, I think they still have it, this long tablecloth that's way too long. And you walked past the table and man, yo, when you fell, Max, the ground shook, man. I've never man, seen a 6'8 guy that. or 6'7 six, six, guy ground fall, shook. man. I, I shook. Uh, it was... Uh... <laughs> But you went down so damn fast, older, man. And being now, so, man. being now at 66, you don't fall the way I used to fall. That ain't soft at all. It's 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 a hard landing. So I, I'm you know I'm trying to be gingerly. I blinked and you were on the ground. I, bl I blinked and you were on the ground, and the, I thought it was an earthquake for a second, man. I swear uh, you. I, I was, was like, like whoa, boom. boom, right. Right. So I was, and then you coming up, you coming up, you, you what, what cracked me up was that you were getting up, cracking up as if someone else had fell. I'm like, yo, that was you, man. You good? Like, I'm asking you if you're all right. You, you laughing the whole time. I was like, damn. Well, I tell you what, last <laughs> night wouldn't have been the case if I'd been coming down 15 Ooh, steps. Those and, stairs? You know, boom, 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 boom. I, I, I just <laughs> like, oh my goodness. So, so yeah, um, we, we play yeah, here in, in Detroit tomorrow, and this is a team that beat the Celtics. Again, probably was a trap game, but, um, Still, the Celtics are oldest team. You just beat them here. And and Detroit, I think, has uh, – and Detroit has been a kind of a thorn in your side in these last they couple just years. Got a, they just won, too, actually. They, uh, they've got another win. I say that as if they, you know, it yeah. doesn't happen often, but yeah, they've well, got they, another win. Yeah, they beat uh, Cleveland the other day. That's right. So, That's right. so yeah. they have That's some – That's a good team. Kate, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Cave? Uh, I'm trying to think of the, the – Cunningham? Cunningham? Yeah, Cave Cunningham. Is, uh, oh, he, yeah, Cade, Cade, yeah. He is really solid, man. If you watch him play, his ability to stretch out, he, he does remind me, he doesn't have the John Morant crossover thing going. What he has basically is the old school Oscar Robinson. I'm going to take you down. I'm going to take the jump shot. I'm going to get to where I want to go. Uh, I can handle the ball just enough. And he's like a point guard, really essentially a facilitator, setting other people up. So it's going to be fun to see this kid grow as a player. Uh, but uh, I would love for him to see a lot of Marcus Smart tomorrow uh, in the game. Yeah. That would be That's, that's yeah. where I think it all starts and begins. He missed Marcus last time. So Marcus mm -hmm. is not going to forget that. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a good game or at least a, a revenge game for the Celtics. Even though it is a matinee, we'll see how they do with the with the early start. But before we get out of here, Max, we gotta talk about All Star Weekend, man. The the the, the to see all the greats out there. You know, obviously they are in the do we have to? NBA players. I mean, yeah, we do because it's you of all people, Max. You have been advocating to see the Celtics big three back together ever since oh, yeah. Ray Allen left for Miami. I knew your head would cock, cock off as soon as I said that. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we got a picture. We got a picture, Max. And I think honestly, it's. It's relevant for not only Celtics fans, but for those guys, right? I mean, I can't help but wonder if they just got so swept up into the moment that KG was like, oh, man, let's get a pick with these dudes. Or, or maybe Paul was the one, right? Most likely it was Paul. Hey, KG, come on, man. Let's get a pick with, let's get a pick with Ray. Stop playing. And they did it. We don't know what the dialogue was. We don't know exactly what was said. But it was a, it was posted. Paul Pierce himself posted the picture. And, and I think that uh, that meant a lot to, to Celtics fans because, um, it, it, man, it, we've, been waiting, it, we've been waiting to see that for a while. We've been a while. It's been years. It, re it really did. And here's the biggest thing about it. Ray, you have another opportunity to kind of come, come, come clean and come home. And uh, this is a great opportunity. This is about Kevin. But it's about giving him some respect on his side. Uh, mm. and uh, let the fans see whatever they might say, boo, yay, whatever. It doesn't make it, it doesn't make a difference. But your teammates would love to have you back in the building. 
and I've talked to almost every one of them. I talked to Tony Allen. And you're talking about KG night, right? I talked KG? to Big Baby. I talked to March 13th. I talked to KG. Yeah. And, uh, but people want to put a lot of other things in here. Uh, and one of them is when they said uh, that Ray Allen got, he uh, snubbed KG when he came up and get, dapped up LeBron. And, and I guess KG was standing there still. Man. Boy. No, listen. I mean, listen. People, re- people were reading things into tea leaves. Look, that this is the way I read into they it. They weren't though. even there. And I know you're going to agree with me on this. This is the way I read into it. If you're KG, right, in that particular moment, and you see LeBron going for the embrace, you don't want to see that, Max. Come on. There's nothing wrong with that. Like, man, I know what that represents. Like, that man beat us. You know, it stopped me from getting my second title. Y'all want it together. Y'all can have y'all. A moment i'm not going to line up to dap you up after you're saying what up to right, right. you know what i mean like, like what is right. what do people expect i didn't take it as a diss whatsoever i'm just like oh if i'm kg i'm doing the same thing y'all can have y'all moment maybe i'll talk to you later maybe not you know it is what it is but i didn't look at it as like oh he's sitting there being like that mother you know what i mean like i didn't see it that way at all but you know there but people are like that and and this world is like that you think about how many people have been divorced and you think about how they look at their exes and going, you know, they'll see him someplace. I hate her, or you know what? Or, and I, I have an ex. I don't hate her. You know, hey, you know, more power to you. We had something right. special together, yeah. and I'm just going to acknowledge you. And that's the same right. thing I look at Ray and Kevin. Good way to put it. Yeah. They won their they won their championship. The only one that Paul and Ray had, uh, Paul and Kevin has. They have one. Mm-hmm. Ray got Ray has two because he decided to leave, and it was a good business decision for him. So right. I, no, I, but to your point, Max. To your yeah. point, though, I, if you're with your other ex, I ain't gonna say what up to you. Go talk to your other ex. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, <laughs> you know we'll, what I mean. We'll, we'll, we'll holler at you. So I think that's what this is one of those times again for me that uh, I hope that Ray Allen decides to come back here. Uh, I've talked to a bunch of people who are in the front of the office and. You know, there's an open invitation for Ray. Uh, you know, please, Ray, please come back. I hope you come back. You know, uh, they're doing the event. Uh, Kevin Garnett, that's after the game. Um, they're going to do the ceremony ser- similar to Paul's, uh, you know, when they do it. And I think it's a good thing. Um, I almost wish they did it on an entire day like they did with Larry, uh, where they, mm. you know, just shut it down. And, hey, this is a celebration for this dude. Uh, but I do understand, uh, you know, me being one of those guys that, you know, in in my case, I was there for um, 15. Mine was 15 minutes. Uh, that's what that, that was the time when the time we retired, my jersey is like, you got 15 minutes at halftime. We got to get this thing done. And, and, you know, I remember being so rushed. There was two things I didn't do. One, my broadcast, other broadcast partner, uh, Sean Grandy, I didn't even mention his name. And then Sean was like, I can't believe you didn't mention my name. I said, Sean, I forgot to mention my brother's name. (laughs) And I've known him a lot longer and cared for him a lot more than I do for you. So I I think that that's one of those things, again, where you rush through things. I hope Kevin gets the opportunity to kind of bask in the glory, understand the fans' appreciation. Because, uh, I mean, this dude dude was special, man. He he made this... uh, he changed the culture and changed the limelight of Paul Pierce yep. and Ray Allen. Those are two great players, but without, and think of it this way, without either one of those, when I mentioned those three, they weren't going to win unless all three of them played together. That's why I hope that all three of them embrace this moment with Kevin and then eventually, you know, embrace this moment when Ray, Ray gets his jersey retired. I, I might be the only guy pushing for that or, or talking about it, and somebody said the other day to me, so how many, well, can they, you know, retire all kind of jerseys? Well, how many numbers do they have? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of damn numbers in this world. So yeah. you can get numbers, 99, 98, whatever you got number you Schroeder, have. Schroeder but, had a rock the 71. Value, yeah. The respect value you have that you put on a player like Ray to me, that's huge. Yeah, no, no question, Max. And, yeah, that's why I, that's why I wanted to bring it up and make sure that I brought it up before we ended up this uh we close out this episode because at the end of the day, man, not only have you been the one that's been saying this stuff out loud, but you've been talking to all three of those guys directly. It's almost as if like they can't not talk to you without you bringing that shit up. Like, Hey, we're not going to patch this thing up. And this, this could actually, it could finally happen in Boston. You know, that would be, that would be very special. I think. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it would be. And, um, and maybe we can put, um, 
maybe our guy Nick Joel, so we could, uh, you know, calm him down, so he won't be saying Tatum's leaving, Tatum's leaving. You know, when he looks at him, <laughs> and Tatum now takes a picture with Paul, Yo, with Kevin, him, with yeah. with Kevin McHale. I mean, those guys were all standing, you know, shoulder to shoulder, and Paul Pierce. That was a cool picture, and it puts him into a moment. And and Robert mm -hmm. Parrish was there also. It puts him in a moment where he's going, man. There's some history here, and that history is cool. You heard what he said after it? I heard all I heard him saying how he was just so grateful that it happened. He was amazed. Yeah. He said he said that, but I love the line that he used. He said, uh, it almost felt like I didn't belong in that picture. Wow. Like that's a lot. Like for him to say that, that just shows where his head is at. Like, man, like I gotta live up to you know the the his mystique. I mean, I, I think it's very relevant for him. Uh when you think about Tatum. Think about Brown. It's a it's a defined history that you don't have with any other professional franchise. People can talk about the Lakers, but the Lakers didn't have the first black player. The Lakers didn't have the first black coach. The Lakers didn't have the first uh, starting black five. Didn't have that. Uh, this is a very significant franchise when it when you think about professional basketball and what they've been to the table, what they bring to the table. This is one of the original teams that started this all and for them to um for them to do for Tatum to be into that 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 kind of uh, bubble that kind of light man that was that was such a cool I mean that's a picture that he can hold on forever with those yeah. guys standing he's in the middle and those guys on the side man that was so cool I just think it's another sign of his of him maturing you know when he said that you know for him to say that I almost don't belong in this picture it's almost like well take that with you take that energy with you and and let it drive you into being into a championship, you know, conversation. Because that's what we really want to see this team at the end of the day. I know we talked about this team being a contender and how the national media is sort of putting mm -hmm. on them on that pedestal. But we haven't seen it quite yet, right? We haven't, we haven't been comfortable enough to call this team a championship team yet. And um, I, I think for Tatum to say that, it's without, relevant. Without people sure. looking at you like you were crazy? I mean, yeah, I don't exactly. Think anybody looked at this team at championship when when I've heard people mention this, and I think Sean Sean Grandy, my broadcast partner, was saying that he said that in some somebody's world, the Celtics are right now not the best, but they are favored by percentage points to win the championship. I don't think any of us would have ever even mentioned those kind of words about a month ago, month and a half ago. We were just like. Man, if we can just get through the playoffs, get to the playoffs, uh, you know, in good shape. But now, you know, they're playing great basketball.